everyone. Welcome to the second series of the Leader Speak webinar. Today's webinar is titled, Where Will People Go? Climate-Induced Relocation from Retreat to Migration. Our guest speaker is Patrick Marchman, and today's webinar is hosted by Todd DeVoe. The Leader Speak webinar series is a collaboration between the Emergency Management Network and Speak and Spark. My name is Holly Manny Yoskui, and I'm the founder of Speak and Spark. Speak and Spark is a platform all about making it easier to source and share expertise within disaster risk and resilience. This Leader Speak 2022 series is focused on the intersection of emergency management and disaster. The goal of these webinars are to provide high quality content that spurs conversation and action. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate the time you've taken to be here and your interest in this subject. A few overview items. Um, first, the format of today's presentation is an approximate 30 minute presentation followed by a Q&A session. All of today's event is live. We have enabled both the Q&A and the chat features. We really encourage questions. We ask you to put all your questions into the Q&A section and they will then create a queue that we will address after Patrick's presentation. The chat is a great place to connect, connect and network. Feel free to introduce yourself there. And if you'd like to share your contact information, we do suggest using your LinkedIn profile. Uh, we'll, we won't always be monitoring the chat. So again, the best place for the questions is in the Q&A feature. Today's webinar is being recorded and you will be an, emailed a link to the recording. Now, let me introduce the host of the Leader Speak webinar series. Chances are you may already know him, Todd DeVoe. Todd DeVoe is an emergency management educator and the host of numerous podcasts, including the Todd DeVoe Show, launched through the Emergency Management Network. Todd is a lifelong learner, and he holds a Master's of Public Administration from Cal State Fullerton, a Master's of Emergency Management from the University of Applied Research and Development with endorsements from Texas A&M, and he is a graduate of the National Emergency Management Executive Academy. He continues to research and write about important emergency management issues, crisis leadership, business continuity, and community resilience. Todd is an active member of the International Association of Emergency Managers and president of Region 9, as well as a Speak and Spark speaker. Thank you, Todd, for facilitating today's conversation. Oh, it's my pleasure, Holly. And thank you for all the work that you've done putting this program together. Uh, it's amazing the work that goes into uh, doing these series. And uh, Holly, you, you're just, it's, it's, I'm just happy to be working with you. <laughs> Today, we're talking about the impact of climate change, not just theory, right? And we have the physical reminders of how the earth is changing and how intense heat waves are sweeping through Northern India right now, as we speak with record highs of 120 degrees Fahrenheit, parts of the capital of Delhi. This is the fifth heat wave since March for them. Lake Mead, the nation's largest man-made reservoir, home to the Hoover Dam, is hitting historic low water levels threatening not just the water supply to as many as 25 million people in the Western United States, but also it is bringing millions of households, 1.3 million households to be exact, drinking water and power, right? Wait, Lake, the water in Lake Mead located in Arizona, Nevada has dropped the elevation of 1,055 feet, the lowest since 1937. And the federal officials have declared a water shortage in the Southwestern United States and the area served by Lake Mead. Water being a lifelong source of life is also a source of destruction. Studies have found that climate change is melting gigatons of ice in the Arctic and the Antarctic, contributing to rising sea levels that threaten the urban centers around the world. The core issue is water that forces people to leave their homes. And today we have with us Patrick Merchman, who is this, uh, well, he's a, a great expert in the field of climate change and specifically um, in how it impacts people and force them to migrate. Before we start, I want to thank our sponsors, the Natural Disaster and Emergency Management Expo for sponsoring Leader Speak for 2022 webinar series. We're excited to continue a relationship with them, and we hope that you will reach out to NDM to see the great things that they're doing for emergency management profession. 
and also Disaster Tech. I'd like to thank Disaster Tech to encourage you to visit their website and check out some of the great stuff that they're doing. The new branding they just the new branding they just released, and learn more about their tools to help save lives, protect the environment, and build resilient communities with a purpose-built decision support technologies for practitioners and research in disaster risk management. And again, we want you to know that in the second half of today's session, we're going to be answering audience questions and we encourage questions for Patrick. So please use the Q&A box uh, so we can get them queued and answered. And if you have any logistical questions or anything like that, that's what the chat's for. And we have team members that are monitoring that to, to help you out. Well, let's introduce Patrick. Patrick is an award-winning program manager and planner. He specializes in resilience, climate adaptation, and climate risk, and climate-induced relocation and managed retreat. And everybody pay attention to the term manager retreat. We're seeing more and more issues across coastal United States um, with this and what it really means and the impact it has um, on the population there. Hazard mitigation, environmental planning, and sustainability. Patrick has managed local, state, and regional programs with over a billion dollars in funding, and he has found the industrial leading climate migration and manager treat group with the American Society of Adaptation Professionals with climate adaptation space. Um, he serves as a board member of several other climate and natural hazard focused organizations, and he has built the climate resilience and sustainable, uh, sustainability practice. And he's author of Planning Relocation and Response to Climate Change, Multifaceted Adaptations. And Patrick has a passion for uh, making connections and deliver solutions in the climate crisis to build more resilient and sustainable world. Patrick, welcome to the program. Well, thank you, Todd, and thank you, Holly. Um, thank you, everyone, for setting this up. I really appreciate it. So, um, do you see me for a second? I'm going to share my screen so you don't have to look at me, my face too much for a second, and uh, we shall get started. One second, share screen. All right. Okay. Now we're going to go full screen. So anyway, um, thank you so much. Um, so as Holly mentioned, uh, my presentation will be um, titled, Where Will People Go? Uh, Climate-Induced Relocation from Retreat to Migration. So again, a little bit about me. Again, Todd gave the intro. So, um, so you know, there's a couple other things to mention. So currently, I'm a senior climate risk and resilience advisor with Stantec. Um, I've also done a lot, a range of independent consulting work for insurance, international development, um, and a host of other fields. And so, um, so yeah, I've, I have a master's degree in marine affairs from the University of Washington. I'm also a certified um, planner from the American Planning Association, and uh, also recently certified sustainability and climate risk professional. I mentioned the planner portion because I think, uh, well, as we'll see, this is a very interdisciplinary space. And I actually, yesterday, I gave a presentation on um, some work I've done with the Climate Migration Network at the APA's online um, National Planning Conference. So um, let's get started. So I think we should first start with a little bit of I, I, you know, I know Thomas, I know, I know um, Todd promised that um, it wasn't going to be too theoretical, but I want to step back a bit and talk about climate change. Like, what is it? Because I think sometimes the way we frame it is distracting. Um, so I think, you know, it's really important to think about these things in a certain way to at least kind of know, you know, know what we're, know what we're talking about and make it a little more relevant to um, sort of uh, our our space. So what is it? So uh, climate change is a shorthand for anthropogenic human caused changes in global climate. So I look at it as one of a set of interlocking crises. Um, some of them include uh, biodiversity and species extinction. It's been said that we're kind of, we're in the middle of uh, the sixth great mass extinction in um, the, the history of life on earth right now. Pollution. I know pollution sounds almost a, a bit retro at times because there's so many other specific things, but the uh, uh, things there's endocrine, endocrine disruptors, um, uh, you know, uh, plastic particles showing up now pretty much in, in the bodies of almost every human being alive. These things matter and these things make a difference. Food availability. Um, we saw very faint intimations of that um, earlier on in the pandemic when shelves started emptying. And we're seeing a little bit more now as the war in uh, Ukraine is causing severe um, disruptions of grain shipments uh, from an area of the world that feeds an awful lot of people. And the last one I think is important.
complicated than people really um, understood. But resources are finite, and we see things everywhere from you. Know, You know, frankly, proven um, rather accurate. Um, there's a, a there's a book that came out actually a couple of weeks ago. The limits uh, I think was the limits of fifty. I forget the title of it, but it's a it's an excellent book with a lot of contributors from uh, around the world and some of the original uh, scientists on this as well. Kind of looking back and saying, "Yep, we're on track." So. Climate change uh, for the emergency management profession in general can be thought of as a force multiplier. Uh, very few things you can point out and say, that's climate change. Climate change though loads the dice. Climate change makes severe events more likely. It makes them more intense. It's kind of hiding behind the curtain if you wanna think of it that way. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of cumulatively increasing stresses and amplifying hazards. Um, uh, one example I like to use is, uh, you know, in the example, say we have a hundred year old or so American city where you have um, sewer systems and such that have been set up um, for the needs of a, of a city of that time. And, you know, every additional rainstorm, it can't handle one rainstorm, it can't handle two rainstorms, but each ad additional rainstorm, there may be 10% more precip precipitation that comes faster, or um, if it changes from snow to rain just kind of adds another few percent of strain. And so again, it gets cumulatively, it grows and grows and grows until some point, the system collapses. I think you can also think of it in general as discontinuity. Um, I mean, you use that phrase from a climate futurist, Alex Stepan has written a lot of really excellent stuff on this. It, it, it's pretty much the end of predictability. Um, a lot of times we think of climate as, okay, we're, we're gonna predict it will be this temperature in the future. Well, that's part of it. But what we're seeing in real life is that pat patterns change, weather patterns change. Um, a lot of things are harder to predict. Past conditions are increasingly becoming unreliable for um, the, future, the, the future state of the world. And this is becoming evident. Again, another example is the heat wave uh, last summer in the uh, Pacific Northwest. Um, I think the, I remember seeing a photograph of a Portland streetcar that was simply not built for the heat and the, the, the cable melted. And things like that is, are really hard to predict, but you're gonna see more of that as time goes on. So yesterday, the climate has always changed. Before human beings, it's you've gone from um, what has been called snowball earth um, several hundred million years ago to um, the carboniferous period where, you know, all the part, large parts of the world were effectively a jungle. Um, the ice ages themselves in recent, you know, relatively recent geologic history, we saw um, sea levels drop almost uh, 250 feet uh, to the point where, uh, you know, a, a lot of continents, you know, grew quite large. In the beginning of the Holocene, so the period we're in right now is generally termed the Holocene, the past 12, 13,000 years. It's an interglacial period um, of frankly remarkable climate stability um, compared to the past one, two million years. So um, we as a civilization from the Sumerians onward are in a very fortunate uh, band for things such as agriculture and things like that. So historic examples, the little ice age that happened in the 1600s and 1700s. So um, again, there's debate on the causes, there's um, theories that, it, uh, that a lot of the, um, the mass, the, the, the mass die-offs of Native Americans uh, contributed to um, extra forest growth, which sucked more carbon in the atmosphere and cooled down Europe pretty quickly. But you see paintings of um, ice skaters on the Thames River and such. That was a real thing that, uh, that had huge, eventually huge geopolitical impacts. Volcanic eruptions, we've seen that as well in history. Um, that um, right down to Mount Pinatubo in the 1990s, when they throw up um, sulfur into the atmosphere, that can result in temporary global cooling. That really does make a difference. The year without a summer in the mid 1800s is something again that was recorded throughout the United States and in Europe, where there was reports of snow in um, parts of the, of the United States that didn't really see it um, normally in June or July. So climate change today. So what's different now? So the speed of change is unprecedented since the Permian mass extinction before the dinosaurs. And so just to give you context, <coughs> excuse me, 
the Permian mass extinction was sometimes referred to as the great dying where over 90% of um, earth species died. That so, ma so many species perished that the courses of rivers for several million years afterwards were straighter because there was less biological material that fell into the rivers. Um, human land use right now is preventing the animal and plant migrations that um, happened previously. Um, life is very adaptable. Uh, but it's harder to adapt uh, when you're a tree trying to get across a Starbucks parking lot. Um, and right now we have nearly 8 billion, I don't know if you have 8 billion yet, but we're, we're on track, I think, 9.7 billion by 2050 in terms of the human population. That's a lot of human beings. Um, and a lot of those human beings in the, in the majority world are looking for standards of living more comparable to those in the, uh, in the developed world. And that's going to have a lot of demands on, on, on everything. The warming, we're, and there's one thing, point that I really want to make. Um, so again, a lot of these discussions, we talk about greenhouse gases, and, and I think it's great. We, we need to you know, reduce emissions. Good. Um, but even if you did that today, if you stopped all emissions today, warming would continue for a significant amount of time. Because the warming we're seeing today is not from our current emissions. It's not as if I turn on the car, CO2 goes in the atmosphere, immediately that causes warming. It actually has a lag time, a lag time of, I think it's been estimated up to 10 or 20 years. So the warming we're seeing right now is from emissions potentially um, only up to the year 2000. So we've been pumping a lot more CO2 since then. So that's something to really, really keep in mind when you hear people ha make, you know, have these discussions. And there's a little uh, illustration I like to use, not the least because I was telling Todd earlier, I like stick figures. They're always funny um, illustrations. Um, it, it illustrates a basic truth, which is uh, scientists and uh, politicians, but also me stand in for a lot of other people, look at um, exponential growth functions very differently. And you see that right now in a lot of climate related um, indicators. So a politician, a lot of times the general attitude is, you know, you look down, you, when you see a trend, you're like, okay, things look okay right now, we're, we're okay. And it's only when you're frankly too late, you recognize that there's exponential growth. While scientists will look early on and say, you're starting to see the footprints of the, the footprints of exponential growth right now. And so I think, you know, yeah, not to glorify science too much, but I think, I think we all need to step back and try to, um, uh, adapt our views a little bit more on the science side, um, because I think, you know, again, um, by the time you see something right really, really prominently, um, it's going to be too late to do a lot about it. So climate change tomorrow. So again, the speed of change is accelerating. Those hockey stick graphs um, are somewhat famous, but they're, they're accurate. Um, you know, things are kind of moving faster and faster. Um, the IPCC projection. So the, inter, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is sort of the gold standard in terms of climate projections. It's a UN body. They, they've been doing this for a very long time. Um, so when people talk about that, they're usually, you, they're usually pulling stats from that, from their, their work. And it's extremely good work. However, um, the way science works is that it's, it's not an accurate position. The way there, there's a lot of participants in the IPCC. And they don't pick out one number and say, we all agree on that number. The number is a consensus number. So in, in some ways you can imagine it as an average. Um, and again, it's not completely accurate, but just think of it for a second as an average. An average is not the precise number you're gonna see. It's the middle point of numbers. You can see 50% more than that or 50% less than that. And so one of the things that um, the next bullet talks about from individual scientists, and it's almost become to me, a, I almost expect it at this point. Um, and they will say things like, we expected what we're seeing today in 10 years, in 20 years, over and over again, they will say that. The people who are really looking at these projections are saying everything is happening too fast. Um, the last thing, uh, potential Antarctic and Greenlandic great glacier melt is likely to drive sea level rise beyond IPCC projections. So a lot of, the, one of the figures you hear sometimes is maybe, three feet, one meter by 2100. Um, I think that personally is a bit implausible. Um, I, I would personally bet, and if someone wants to grab a Ouija board or you know make a note for the future and let me know how this works out in 2100, my personal bet is three meters by 2100. Again, I might be wrong, but there's a lot more factors going in there. And again, 
the, the conservatism science, which is very useful in terms of making sure things are as close to reality as possible, can also create a bit of a blind spot at certain times. So some of the overarching trends um, in the environment uh, that also are related to this. Um, Number one is increasing climate impacts. So we've talked about a little bit about this. So what impacts are happening? So number one, the water cycle. One estimate I think I've read is that the water cycle, um, which is basically the movement of water from, from clouds to rain, to rivers, to evaporation, has accelerated by 10 to almost up to 20% over the past um, half century. So that means the water is moving faster. That means you're gonna get you know, more water dropping out of the sky. That means you know, water is gonna flow faster. And so if you're a floodplain manager of some sort, you need to think about that. Wildfire and droughts, again, wildfire is happening. Um, you know, a lot of this also has to do with the fact that frankly, uh, our urban development patterns have sprawled in places where people shouldn't be living. <laughs> um, we saw videos in December when wildfires were swooping into frankly, Denver's and Boulder suburbs. It's pretty terrifying because I went to Chuck E. Cheese as a kid to see people running out of a Chuck E. Cheese because of the fire in the parking lot is existentially terrifying. However, it wasn't just the development patterns, it was the fact the winds were different than they were before. And there was the snow that was usually on the ground at that time was not, simply because again, it's getting less and less common to have that snow. And droughts again. Um, the 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 southeast, the southwest of the United States um, is uh, by a lot of a lot a lot of researchers saying it's starting to be in sort of a mega drought pattern, as in the droughts are not going to let up. So if you're again if you're in an area like that, which includes a big chunk of the western United States, you need to be thinking about this in terms of you know it's maybe less. It's probably um, less of a sure bet to count on the rains coming because the rains are going to change uh, and it's probably not going to be in your favor. Urban sprawl, again, as I mentioned before, the expansion of vulnerabilities, we, we, keep, we keep moving outwards. And so we move out into wildfire susceptible areas. We move into areas, we build on areas that, you know, people who've lived there 100 years ago will say, of course, we didn't build here because it's a floodplain. It flooded. We build there, though. We keep doing it over and over. This is our development, you know, our development patterns, our economies really run on this expansion, and it puts us in more into harm's way. And also really um, impacts the capacity of infrastructure to function. Um, one, uh, one really interesting contributor, contributor to resilience is uh, frank, frankly having infrastructure that's less vulnerable, and sometimes you know very long, uh, very long spread out, you know highways and homes and such, and 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 utilities are more vulnerable than denser, um, more close together uh, infrastructure in other places. Uh, the disproportionate impacts to vulnerable populations. So I mentioned before, um, you know. A lot of times where we choose to build makes a difference. Uh, historically, um, where we've chosen to build for um, you know, populations of African Americans and others has been in less favorable places. We've we've made we've moved people into places that flood more. We move the people, you know, we, we've redlined them into less advantageous areas. And that means that those populations that are still disproportionately there are gonna be among the first that will hit. And that is something to really, really think deeply about. Um, the legacies of racism and such are, you can be, see it written on the landscape. And also the last thing I wanna mention is black swans. This is a term from Nassim Taleb. Um, again, he's a very dense writer, but if you wanna pick up Anti-Fragile, which is an excellent book on resilience or um, the black swan, it's definitely worth your time. Um, and these are events you can't really predict. You, you, I mean, these are things that sort of come out of nowhere um, to most people's minds. Uh, but again, as you, as you load the dice, the, the, the chances that a black swan comes up start getting higher and higher and higher. So again, things that you are not going to expect um, are going to be likely. So Todd mentioned in his intro, um, five heat waves in the Indian subcontinent this year. And um, that's, that, that, that's pretty dramatic, even for India. And so you, again, you're going to load that sort of dice again. You're seeing in Australia, the, the floods uh, around Lillismore in Queensland, where my wife spent about, uh, you know, nine months in school there. Um, when, you know, you actually see those videos, um, and the fact that it keeps getting hit over and over. And these sort of things that you think are really improbable are gonna become more probable. Overarching trends socially. So social attitudes. 
So um, COVID-19 and climate change. So I'd like to think of COVID-19 as, um, to credit a, a, a podcast citations needed, um, the tiniest hors d'oeuvre on the never ending buffet that is climate change. Um, it, it, the, the collective capacity of a society to function, to deal with it, um, is really indicative of how a society will be able to function in terms of continued extreme weather stresses. And I think that's something we need to take it to heart, especially as the United States passed 1 million COVID deaths. And that's, of course, probably an undercount as it is in almost every country in the world. Um, that's something to really think about because, again, social cohesion, state capacity, these things really matter. These things save lives. Disinformation. Um, we've seen a lot of disinformation from a lot of quarters over the past um, decade, especially. Uh, social media has been weaponized in many, many ways, and even the nature of it, even without malicious actors, um, uh, has, you know, by some measures, uh, decreased the tension spans quite a bit. We're only, we're at the very early stages of what this is doing to our brains, but it does make a difference. And it does in some ways, some people think it makes it harder for us to really see these bigger patterns and deal with them. The last thing I want to talk about with this is generational shifts. So one is generational inequality. So you see this in sort of the housing markets and that um, as housing prices in the U.S. and globally kind of soar, it gets harder and harder for younger people to kind of climb the property ladder. Um, and this makes a difference. Uh, politically, uh, you, you can probably expect there will be tensions coming uh, between the older generations who are, you know, just by sitting in a house can become millionaires in some places um, and the younger generations who aren't getting that chance anymore. And you also see um, it's uh, almost, a, almost a, a battle of the extremes, especially among younger people between doomerism, which is the idea that climate change, that we're doomed, that, you know, and sometimes goes to the extreme of human extinction, which I personally do not believe. Um, and then either side of the techno optimism, the Elon Musk followers of the world. You see again the idea that technology will save everything. You see these sort of extremes here. And in a lot of ways, it's a reaction to the fact that as a society, as a global civilization, we're not really handling this very well right now. And so people are looking for answers in whatever way they can find them. And lastly, the over overarching trends in policy. So um, Oh, good. 10 more minutes. All right. Thank you for that text. All right. So I want to hurry up here. So national policy. Some plan countries are planning ahead. Uh, Indonesia is one. Indonesia actually is uh, moving uh, its capital inland to central Borneo because Jakarta is slowly sinking under the is is going to be sinking under the waves. A lot of subsidence there happening right now as well. Other other countries are not really doing this. They don't want to spook the horses for fear of devaluing investments. I would put the U.S. in some ways in that category. International policy. So right now there's a problematic status of climate refugees. Climate refugees are not really recognized under international law as refugees. Um, a, a lot of developed countries are very skittish about this, especially in the Pacific, um, because they're, they don't want to open the door for a lot of people. We've seen case, actual cases in the past decade where they've been, people have been denied refugee status. But I don't think that's going to be a permanent thing. International migration, again, uh, we've seen the migration from... Um, from Africa and the Middle East in the past to Europe in the past uh, decade, as well as migration from Latin America to the US. I think that's going to intensify as well. And the last thing is well, where are gonna, people are going to go? So right now, the general pattern, um, people are really, they want to, they generally move in, inside their own countries first. Um, but eventually they often move to the developed world. So we're talking about Europe, we're talking about Australia, we're talking about North America. And overall, right now, there simply isn't much of a realistic policy approach out there. People are starting to think about it, but we're, we're, we're kind of behind. We're reacting. We're not, we're not leaving. So climate and migration. So it's always happened. So you can look back at the, the genus Homo as expanded from um, Java man to you know, the Neanderthals to what, what have you. Um, people move. That's what we've always done. The population of the Americas, and now we're pushing this back to 35, 45,000 years, even longer. Um, it, it's interesting that a lot of the Native American uh, ideas about their origins tend, are proving to be a little more right than, you know, people, than scientists thought. Um, but again, people kept moving. And there's been the push factor in many nomadic migrations of history. One example is the, 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 the um, migrations to the Western Roman Empire, almost like a, almost like playing pool. Uh, the climate just had one tribe hitting to another tribe, and eventually they went all the way to Europe. 
So what's different now, again, it's the scale, it's the speed, and it's the mobility. The fact now is that you don't have to get on a horse and bring your entire population. People can jump on airplanes, they jump on boats. People are much more mobile and much faster than in the past. So this is an illustration from a... Uh, from a series of from ProPublica and the New York Times in 2020. That is a series of good illustrations, but I want you to look, you can look at this right now and draw your own conclusions, but I want you to actually look at the very bottom more than anything else. Because in the bottom, look at the green spots here. So this, in terms of RCP 8.5, this is one of the higher uh, uh, scenarios from the IPCC. Um, those green spots are the more livable parts. So you've actually look at that, Country, entire countries are almost going to be not in the optimal level spaces. They're going to go somewhere. I would go somewhere. I'm not going to sit there and, you know, see my family suffer. I would do it. So they're going to do this. So I think it's something to really think about for those of us in North America. So manage retreat, let's talk about that really quick. So manage retreat is sort of the, the cousin to climate migration. If climate migration is you know, nations and such, great grand, grand history. Managed to treat as communities, it's individuals, it's households. Community relocations in US history have been quite frequent um, from, you know, uh, communities from flooding dams to such. This has happened quite a bit. Um, some of the most notable recent examples were in the Midwest after floods in the 1990s, Valmeyer, Illinois, Soldiers Grove, Wisconsin. These towns are sort of like bywords in the emergency management community. Um, there's one at about an hour north of where I am, Pattsburgh, Missouri, and I drove out there a little while ago and to kind of take a look at that. In response to climate change, some other examples, more recent examples include Ilda Jean Charles in Louisiana and New Talk, Alaska. New Talk, Alaska has a film from Patagonia Films that um, has just come out. I would highly recommend that. Um, also, so this is usually done right now through buyouts of homes and property. And generally, I think buyouts, we tend to think FEMA funding, although it's not exclusively. Um, HUD and a lot of agencies have a lot of funding themselves. Currently, it can take a long time. A 2019 NRDC study estimates that the typical FEMA buyout could take over five years. I don't know if that's still accurate, but it tells you that we, we can't, you, you cannot effectively retreat large scale. If you take over five years, it just won't happen. So something needs to change. Climate migration versus managed retreat. Um, so climate, again, climate migration is larger scale population movements. Uh, some estimates go up to even billions by 2100. Managed retreat is, uh, you know, again, a smaller scale. It's direct, but it also could be indirect. And so this may be a, maybe a um, partially managed retreat by house valuation changes. And, you're, and I think we'll get to this maybe in another slide, but um, uh, when houses that are more vulnerable start kind of dipping in value or their value decelerates, you're gonna see people um, always making the choice on their own to move. Some examples, New Orleans and Hurricane Katrina. So in 2005, um, there were lots of buyouts of homes afterwards. There was a post-Katrina diaspora. Uh, a lot of people in New Orleans did not come back. And it's a really interesting phenomenon because um, you know, the, 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 numbers, the, 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 the numbers were huge. Um, and I would say it's both are on the spectrum of climate migration and managed retreat. And I really hope there's more work academic, academically gonna be done on this because I think it's a really fascinating subject. International migration, the Syrian civil war. So crop failures around 2010, 2011 put even more pressure on the Syrian government. Um, and there were a lot of the first protests um, after the Arab Spring against um, Bashar al-Assad's government were due to food prices. So you can say, I, I think it's very legitimate to say that climate change was a factor, weather patterns were a factor in what happened. In Central America, something similar is happening right now. Again, it's been documented in the New York Times that um, a lot of subsistence farmers in Guatemala and Honduras and places like that um, simply saw the weather patterns change where they couldn't make it anymore. And so they started moving north. They moved north, they moved to the cities and they tried to move north to Mexico and then they tried to come to the United States. And, you know, again, these are people who, who, are, are not, who are not doing this lightly. So uh, talking about the, this whole field, um, relocation, adaptation, disaster risk reduction. So the first thing I want to mention is this is extremely sensitive. I would say it's, I would call it the third rail of climate adaptation. Um, no one wants to take it lightly, but people don't like to talk about it. Um, they, you know, a lot of people want to assume that it's, the, that it's not going to happen or such. Um, 
and it's it's I've had many many discussions on personal levels at times um, where this whole idea is almost treated as something that is offensive uh, for a host of reasons. Equity and justice issues are frequent. A lot of times, you know, people in disadvantaged communities are the ones who've been pushed out historically. They've been you know having, the, pardon my French, white people pushing them around for you know hundreds of years, and now we're going to push them around again. Um, the, and again, the NRDC, good, all right, the NRDC study indicates that, listen, again, the typical buyout, and it's, it's a very powerful and necessary tool for long-term adaptation, near-term risk reduction, but there is a tangible reluctance to do this, to really embrace it, and also to work across agency. Um, FEMA and HUD and the Corps of Engineers, oftentimes in reality, barely talk to each other. They barely even know what the programs, their, each other's programs are. And in communities, communities don't really care about the turf wars or the bureaucracy. They want help. And I think you know, we're gonna have to figure out how to coordinate and kind of do that. So again, really quick. Um, so climate irrigation money, here's another thing that I think is talked about way too little. We in this emergency management community often think of money as a thing. We get money from a funding source, we spend it, we do things. That's not how the real world works completely. Um, you know, the real estate, finance, insurance profoundly impact the physical uh, layout of the, the, the landscape. Property values are gonna take a hit and it's not gonna just gonna be when the sea level literally rises. You know, frequent storm surges, frequent sunny day flooding, that will make that will make an impact. Right now you're seeing musical chairs almost in places like Miami where uh, investors are competing to be sort of the last, you know, to get out get their money kind of turned over before the music stops. Potential uninsurability property, you're seeing this right now in California to do to wildfires. You see this in other places. I know this because I've worked with insurance people. It's being talked about. When jobs leave, so are the people. Uh, a lot of times, you know, industrial facilities, things like that are going to get tired of it, get tired of the flooding, get tired of the, of the fires. And that's going to hurt communities, not just ascending communities, but the receiving communities where people are going to go are potentially going to see surges in population. You see this places like Ann Arbor um, and in the, the north and the north, they're actually looking at this, trying to think about this, about how to accommodate people who they expect will come. And last, um, Last thing I want to say, sort of the, the large scale impacts. So again, the IPCC projections consistently come down on the low end of the observations. If you want to take one thing from this, this whole talk, it's probably going to be worse than you think in terms of climate projections. Many, if not most, global alpha cities on population are very close to shorelines. New York City, Lagos, Shanghai are you know, built as port cities. Um, oh, the list goes on and on. They're going to get impacted. And even before it's officially underwater, it's going to hurt. People tend to migrate as close home as possible at first, but it does not stop at the destination. Over the next few decades, higher population countries in more vulnerable areas are likely to send people to more populated countries. You can look at a map, you can do the math. I'll say I, I didn't put this in the slide, but I can tell you a few things. Um, there's, there's anecdotal evidence of migration into Russia from India and China right now. I would say places like Australia is very low populated and should expect um, interest. And I would say to our Canadian friends and family and neighbors, um, they should probably start um, thinking about this as well. And one last thing I want to say, it's a bit of hope and such, communities and countries with higher trust levels are likely to maintain cohesion and quality, quality of life better than countries that attempt to simply shut the gates. Uh, walls never worked long term. The Great Wall of China never worked. Eventually, the barbarians came over. That's what happens. Fostering trust is, will be a disastrous reduction in self. Building the sinews of community is what is going to really make a difference, I think, long term. Again, thank you. Please, um, if you want to hear more or, um, you know, please feel, feel free to reach out at any time. Um, there's my LinkedIn address. You can find me there. I post a lot on this sort of stuff. Also, email me. I'd be happy to, you know, answer whatever questions you have. And I appreciate everyone's time. So I think, how do I do on time, Holly? Todd? You did great on time. Excellent. All right. Thank you. So, so Patrick, thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. And I mean, I know there's a lot to take in on this. Um, and it's something that we're really going to have to, uh, uh, to be watching and, and, and as emergency managers and professionals in this field, um, we really need to pay attention to what this means um, on, on the impact of the communities 
and on services and on the people uh, that are, are, are migrating. So we're gonna move to question and answers. Um, so please, if you already haven't already put some in, uh, please put them in the, in the Q&A um, section. Uh, I know we have a couple there, but uh, I'm sure there's more coming up. Uh, and we're gonna get to them as many as we can. Uh, if we can't get to all of them, um, what we'll do is we'll see how we can uh, get them answered. Uh, maybe Patrick can, uh, if you would be kind, uh, maybe I can send them over to you and you can answer them um, in your time. Would that be great? Sure. sure. Okay, awesome. So that being said, our first question that we have is from Elizabeth. And she goes, how do you go um, about predicting, quote unquote, because yeah, predicting is a hard word to use, uh, climate trends when historical data uh, is no longer reliable? That, that's a good question and kind of tricky. Um, so, uh, so again, a lot of this, you know, through the through scientific data, and I, again, I don't claim to be a science per, scientist personally, but there are, there are things we can, there are things we can, you know, we can learn through different, you know, sciences. Um, while past sort of uh, records of condition, you know, a lot of times engineering, you look at sort of historical records. Um, that doesn't that doesn't mean entirely that you know that the past is completely unreliable. What that does mean is that you have to start using you have to start taking into account the trends that you're seeing. So you make estimates, you make guesses, yeah, and some of those guesses work better than others. And I think you know the the better data, the better models, you actually can't you actually can't do that. There's also a discipline called foresight, which I've dipped my toes into a bit, which you know, again is trying to help people have that sort of view of the future and looking at this. I'd like to think of it as like. Um, putting headlights on a car that's hurtling down a, you know, a, a freeway at 70 miles an hour in the dark. Um, you know, again, it's not going to be perfect, but um, there are ways, there are ways to see that again, you know, um, and we, we, we're, we're decently good at that, but it's also good enough to say that, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes, uh, what is that? I'm just going to think the, um, the essence of wisdom is to be able to say, you know, uh, say basically that um, we don't know. And that some of the that the models are just to looking at in the, in the future, and they're telling us, you know, they can't really predict it. So, you know, again, it's another indication of um, general trend towards unpredictability. And and his predictability is always it's always the hard part, right? You know, uh, there was a there was a comment um, in the um, in the comment section when, or in the chat talking about the idea of black swans, and um, my answer to that is kind of. Are black swans truly black swans? And so I like to look at the concept of uh, Michelle Wooker's um, um, gray rhino compared to a black swan. Um, is climate change truly, and the effects of that truly a black swan event, or is it more of the gray rhino, something that we could predict or had some inkling that it was coming uh, more than this is a big surprise? I, I think, you, you know, I think climate change itself probably would fall under the gray rhino uh, area. Like, yeah, you put CO2 in the atmosphere, it happens, or you, you live on earth for some period of time, it happens. But I would say the, some of the impacts of climate change, the specific, specific individual events, those are the black swans. Those are the things like when you, again, you, uh, when, when, when you kind of, again, load the dice a bit, when you kind of like, or, or you, Another analogy, I use analogies a lot, I apologize, but if you're playing checkers or something, you just you just pick up the you pick up the board and you throw them in the air. So you can almost say at that point, you know, you don't you can expect something weird is gonna happen in general. But I saying that I think that's really different. The black swan to me is the actual sort of like events, the climate change as a general phenomenon, probably the great rhino. So um what are the attendees who Anonymous. Uh, sometimes disruption can bring opportunity, which uh, reigns industrial industries, companies, actions, etc. Um, we have the most opportunity due to climate change. Will we have the most opportunity due to climate change? That's the question. For example, leading sustainability forces forces companies, governments to recognize due to Ukraine that the uh, net zero emission sustainability, national security uh, regions, um, you know, blessed with various different things, et cetera. Um, so, so are there opportunities um, in, in climate change? I'd say yes. I, 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 it's, it's weird. Um, it's putting in mind of something like 10 years ago when I was in person at the APA conference in Chicago, I think 2012, I was reading a book. 
one of the limits of growth authors like one, um, had read sort of an, an update and you know I was reading in the hallway and you know people were coming up to me just chatting and stuff and I was told like you must be an optimist if you think there's things around and I I do actually I think there will be there are always opportunities I think if you expect everything to kind of go as it is forever, then you're going to be disappointed. I think you truly are. But in terms of like doing things differently, yes, sustainability, whatever. I think a lot of, I was using another example, um, you know, in terms of manage retreat, you, you know, maybe some of the new developments, new communities that are going to have to be built and such, we can rectify some of the earlier mistakes as in, you know, we don't have to be pushing the same people into the be the worst parts of town as we did, you know, for hundreds of years, we can actually, you know, maybe have a transportation system that works a little better, that is more resilient, we can have infrastructure utilities that, you know, you know, don't go down so easily, because right now, I've heard, you know, like you have warnings, I think Texas last week about warnings for brownouts and you know if you build something new and different and think through it in different ways you can actually maybe some of this more reliable i think there are a lot of opportunities it's going to be tough but i think there's um yeah i think i think there's ways to make some things better out of it you know and, and i want i want people to understand too like when we talk about manager retreat i know we focus on the coastal areas right because of the flooding and on uh, the rise but I mean, in California, there was a uh, city, and I forget the name of it, and I talk about the city all the time, and I always forget, the Central California, um, where they ran out of water completely. Um, and so residents had to put external cisterns in their, in, in front of their yard, like these big, basically looks like barrel, big, huge barrels, for lack of a better term. Um, and they had to get water delivery from a truck. Uh, mm -hmm. The only way they could have running water for showers and everything, right? So, I mean, in that case, and then those people have to make a decision whether what they want to stay in that community or move, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's not just affecting coastal, it's affecting other areas that are running out of water. Um, Charlotte asked, and she has two parts of a question here, says, um, how do we best react to folks who primarily use mass transportation? And then the other side of it is, because our world is very car-centric, um, I'm going to add on to that, Charlotte, if you, if you let me here, um, I guess I, I'm the host, so I could do it. Uh, is, is mass transportation, is that an answer to our problem with fuel and fuel economy and, you know, I guess burning fossil fuels? I think large, I think, yes. I think in, in a large sense, yes. I think you not only is it much more, um, much less resource intensive, not only in terms of like the actual physical part of it, but also, you know, the sort of the, the fuel that's being used, but also again, encourages a kind of a denser development, which, you know, again, it makes denser development, you know, it can be done wrong, but if it's done right, you can actually, it's easier to do something to bring resilience into that sort of thing. So in a lot of ways, it encourages a development pattern that's, you know, uh, that, that's, that's more of a, that's more adaptive, I think. I think right now, one of the major things that, again, we, we our current development pattern here, especially in North America, is that, um, you know, it's, it's, it makes it hard. And again, you see this right now already happening out in a lot of the exurbs. It is just, it's more dangerous. It is getting more dangerous. And insurance, people who are like, right, having to write checks, they know this. They're, that's why they're starting to look and dumping a lot of these areas. So um, Maya asks, can you walk? Can you talk walk? That part too. Can you walk? No, I, I can't, obviously. Uh, can you talk a bit more about the best practices about um, migration and the things to be hopeful about? Uh, she says, she, I heard you say that things are going to get be worse than we expected and that marginalized communities will be most affected. So any concrete examples of success would be really helpful to hear about. I realize that you said a lot of countries um, are, are very behind. So, yeah, well, I mean, I agree, Maya. I mean, are there some hopeful things? I mean, like, it sounds doom and gloom, but, I mean, could there be some good stories out of this? Well, yeah, I, I think it is a little doom and gloom, but it's also at the same time, there's opportunity in it. So it's almost like you have to wear two sets of glasses, like, you know, it's different lenses. Yeah, there's going to be some bad stuff. And yeah, the people who they will see what you can do for it. I mean, that's how humans get along. So um, in terms of some interesting examples, uh, let me think, I'm going to think of one that I'm personally involved in with the climate migration network. So we recently put out a guidebook called Lead with Listening. Um, it, it 
uh, it's a guide to uh, support community-led conversations about this thing. So it's not just you know a bureaucracy or someone telling people they have to move, but looking at communities, giving them the tools to help decide their own future. And so I actually gave a presentation on this yesterday at the APA uh, APA's conference. Um, I would definitely. Uh, encourage anyone to go to the Climate Migration Network's website, um, climatemigration.org, and I think we have, may have that in the link somewhere. You can um, download it for free. It's, it's basically participatory planning 101, but it's a great reminder, and it's sort of the first step to this. So we're actually piloting this with three communities right now in uh, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Puerto Rico. These are just ex there's some examples in the U.S. I know um, some other places, again, in other parts of the world have, you know, they, they've done this pretty well. And there's actually another example. So there was a book I recently called The Creeks Will Rise, and I forget who wrote it, but it's a gentleman who the first half of it really deals with directly the example of Soldiers Grove of, of Wisconsin. And he, I guess he was a resident of it or something. And it really tells the story of how they moved, how they got the funding. And this was done way from the 1970s, 1980s and such. And it's not perfect. I mean, there's still, you know, some people who live there and it took a little while to get some of the industry back, but the community itself is still there. It's still there and it's more, it's safer in some ways. It's not perfect, but it's a, it's a start and it's a very positive thing. So again, we can do this. It's tough and sometimes we choose not to do the wrong thing, but we don't have to. We make different choices and we make good things happen. I looked it up really quick while you were talking and it's uh, William Becker is the author. Yes. Um, yes. I put the uh, I put the Amazon link. If you don't need, like Amazon, you can find it other ways. But yes. I threw an Amazon link up there uh, for everybody to take a look at. It says, uh, Creeks will wise people exist to, uh, coexisting with floods. Um, it's a... Uh, it looks like uh, seventeen dollars if you're on Amazon. Um, so going back to planning, Richard mentions Richard uh, Christ says you mentioned the net nations. I suppose by extension, regions are more welcoming and trusting of climate. My immigrants will fare better than those who build walls. But you know that as a planner, that this has not been our history. Zoning, in particular, is very much focused on preserving the status quo. How do we change to be more welcoming? That's a that's a that's a loaded question. That's a big question. I have five minutes. That's a crazy one. I, I will say that um, I will say that's a tough one. And I say the history of zoning has largely been that. But again, it doesn't have to be. We can choose to do some things differently. First of all. Second of all, um, I will say that I look at these things like trust, and it really to me is really the response to COVID and such. Um, higher trust societies I literally have had, you can even see this in the death rates, as in, uh, there was actually yes, yesterday, I think the New York Times, I was reading this out of the paper, maybe the day before on the plane, um, and it was looking at why Australia had one-tenth the death rate as the United States, like rate, not in terms of absolute, but the rate. And a lot of it, again, goes to so society, higher trust. Again, Australia is no utopia, but generally the traditions of you know, social trust, people looking and feeling obligations to one another and such. And you saw it, you saw it show up. And this is the kind of thing we're talking about. It's so intangible, but it's also in some ways the most important thing. Like emerge, you also see another book. I, I hate to do this because I, I make you find another book. It was called by Rebecca Solnit. It was called A Paradise Built in Hell. It was about the communities that emerge after disasters. And she looked at things like the uh, Mexico City earthquake, the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, the Halifax explosion like in 1916, and how people did not act the way that Hollywood says they do in disasters. They did not stand there and scream and try to run over each other. They helped each other. Right. They got to, they spontaneously organized and did things for each other over and over and over again. And so what you want to do is create the, the conditions and foster the conditions where people can do that and help each other and do these things. And I think those kind of, that that to me is like almost some of the best resilience you can have, so. Um, the question comes in, um, does managed retreat always reduce risk or vulnerabilities? And I'm gonna answer this really quick about Patrick, I'll let you answer completely is i think that depends on how you how you define risk and vulnerabilities first of all but um people might relocate to vulnerable areas since there is no supervision and monitoring of where people relocate um how can we make sure relocation to safer places that's another 
That's another big one. Yeah, well, that's what I, I can tell you. It's tough, but I do know that I, I alluded to this a bit. So um, the American Society of Adaptation Professionals that I've been involved in has done some work with, um, with, with New York State and with the city of Ann Arbor and a few other places that are trying to really think through this, think through like what it's actually going to look like and where kind of how to create more welcoming conditions. So I think that that's part of that's part of the answer. Um, but again, a lot of it's going to be real. It's going, to, it's going to take a lot of work and thinking through it because we're in a very early stage. Um, but again, I'm, I'm going to be be an optimist again, which sometimes surprises me actually. But um, I think it can be done. I think you know people. So the result there can be good outcomes here. It's just going to take a lot of work, and it's going to take a lot of people talking to each other, and a lot of arguing, and a lot of muddling through. But I think it can be done. Holly, we have seven more questions left. Um, should we go through it and try to answer them, or do you want to uh, just end it here and we'll answer those questions later? Um, you know, why don't we take a, a couple of minutes to wrap up? And Patrick, Patrick, if it's okay with you, we could even stay on a little bit afterwards, just so we give yeah. everyone sort of the following. Sure, okay, cool. Yeah, I, I want to make sure we're, we're taking everybody's time into consideration, and we're right now at the last minute. So, Holly, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Patrick, thank you so much for your time. Um, we will stay on here for a little bit afterwards, answer the questions, but we do have some wrap up to do and I'll, I'm going to hand it over to Holly. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Patrick, for sharing that expertise today and taking the time to field those questions as well. Um, again, thank you everyone for joining us. In these last few minutes, I just want to do a wrap up. Um, the first thing is we really want to hear from you. We have an event feedback survey that um, John just put in the chat right now. In that feedback, we really take serious what you have to share with us. We do get additional insights by collecting demographic information. That demographic information is not shared, but it helps us have a better understanding of our audience feedback. Also, the second section of the review is specifically for our speaker, Patrick Marchman, which is incredibly helpful for him. This form is about four questions and um, we read everything that is shared. Completing the survey enters you into the raffle to win a digital subscription to the Crisis Response Journal. And this is also the place where you can request a certificate of participation, which you can use for the continued education credits. <clears throat> I wanna tell you about our next two webinars. Um, the next one is August 18th, and the topic is the intersection of disasters and climate change with guest and Speak and Spark speaker, Samantha Montano. Samantha will be addressing what our readiness and cap uh, capacity is to manage multiple threats at once within the face of climate change and how this has catalyzed our need for reform within emergency management. She's the author of the book, Disasterology, and I really expect this to be a great and engaging conversation. And our final series is on November 10th, and we just confirmed that's gonna be with investigative journalist Mario Aritza, and he's the author of Disposable City, Miami's Future on the Shores of Climate Catastrophe. So uh, we just dropped those registration in the chat so you can get those on your calendar. And we hope you can join us for both of these webinars. These are open invitation webinars, so please feel free to share them with anyone who's interested within your networks. Um, last, I want to thank Patrick for being here as our guest today. Thank you to the Emergency Management Network and Todd and all the supporters who've worked on the coordination of these sessions. A big thank you to our sponsors for making these webinars accessible. This is the Disaster, Natural Disaster and Emergency Management Expo, NDEM, and Disaster Tech. And last, a huge thank you to our participants for attending and asking questions and your passion and obvious commitment to the field. You can follow the Emergency Management Network and Todd DeVoe um, for more high quality content. And they also have a great Substack that you can stay up to date on the latest information. Please consider Speak and Spark as a resource for both sharing and sourcing expertise related to emergency management, disaster and resilience. It's meant to be a benefit to the field. And last, I hope you learn from today's event and that learning can then spark conversations within your communities. And we really appreciate you being here today. Thank you all for joining us today. And this was a Leader Speak webinar produced by the Emergency Management Network, the trusted voice in emergency management in conjunction with Speak and Spark. Connect to the experts that inform, engage, and inspire. Sponsored by the Natural Disaster and Emergency Management Expo, 
where everyone belongs. Disaster Tech, save lives, protect the environment, and build resilient communities with purpose-built, decision-supported technologies for practitioners and researchers in disaster risk management. Join us on August 18th when Samantha Montano discusses the intersection of disaster and climate change. Sign up today at www.speakandspark.com backslash webinars.